welcome back. This is the Legacy Bible Podcast, the place where you hear lessons from the Bible, from the tape archives of the Fellowship Bible Church in Joliet, Illinois, all taught by our pastor, the Reverend Chuck Raines. I'm your host, Marcus Onate, and I'll be bringing to you more from the tape archives. Today, we happen to have one from, uh, well, one of the later ones from 2023. Is from uh, exactly from March 26th, 2023. And the title is Resurrection and Righteousness, Living in Christ's Victory. So we'll be getting right to that. And I just want to say, make sure you listen to the end, because I always have announcements at the end, but I'm kind of anxious to hear it. So let's get right to it. Take it away, Pastor Raines. A message, <clears throat> a message to someone that's bound up in a prison of servitude, to a harsh master, one who's used his power over that servant's life to inflict pain and to do so without any condemnation by the private citizens around him or the government to this helpless slave. The Spirit directs some words, and they come to you from from the Lord in 1 Peter. I'd like to turn you to 1 Peter 2 at verse 18. I'm going to read this. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Back there in verse 18, these servants, these slaves, are told by God to be submissive. Now, This has caused a lot of confusion as Christians have read these words over the years. I'm sure it was especially difficult to understand uh, 200 years ago when the nation was accepting the idea of slavery and there were Christians that were troubled by that institution, seeing the awful things that it did to people's lives, to read and hear that God tells servants to be submissive to their masters. Well, I want to help you here and tell you it's not because God is saying that slavery is righteous. Now hear this. He's not saying Slavery is righteous. There are those who back in those days who wanted slavery for their own profit would turn to this verse and say, you see, God endorses slavery. He tells slaves to be submissive. Now, it's not because God is endorsing slavery that he says this. Not at all. But because sometimes the values of people with the power to control other people put some people, I'm talking about slaves, put some people in circumstances that they're powerless to change. There are times in human history when that happens. What's going on today? You don't have to look back to pre-Civil War days. Yes, is there slavery today? 
more than you're willing to admit. I think in the most awful way, and this is worldwide, this is not just in some singular or few locations. There is a kind of slavery where women are taken, very often beaten, many times drugged up and used as human slaves in the sex trade. And listen, we're not talking about a few people. We're talking about tens of thousands of people into slavery today. The human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It conceives these terrible acts as ways, really, to use other people for their profit, for their gain. And these people are in circumstances that they are powerless to change. So I want to put the question to you. <coughs> How should a Christian act? How should a Christian respond being the powerless one? Well, let's see what God says. Be submissive to your masters with all fear. <clears throat> you have to understand fear. What is this? Well, it's obviously a sensitivity down in your spirit to the spirit and power of another, another person. Okay. In your spirit, to be sensitive to their spirit. Well, what will that bring about? Well, he's saying in verse 19, this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. So there's an if here. It's commendable if, big if, this qualification has to be met. If because of, that means based on, conscience toward God. In other words, if someone's underlying relationship with God has them focused on what would please him, there's a point of testing here. If that person is living to please God, one's true submission is not to the slave driver, the slave owner, the so-called master, but to the Lord. One's submission is to the Lord in their heart. Above all, that's what God is asking. So that when one suffers wrongfully, and in these conditions that happens over and over and over and over and over again. And when, when that happens, it's, and God's word is correct here, you're brought to grief. Such a person trapped in that situation is brought to grief. The question here is not, do we suffer patiently? That's not the question. You get the whole emphasis wrong if you say, well, God says suffer it patiently. No, it's rather that when we suffer patiently, that we do not do it because we have done evil. Because you can't turn to God and complain that you're suffering because you do evil. He's not talking 
to those suffering wrong, being treated so terribly and saying, uh, patience is just the answer. No, it's only when one does good and suffers for it that we take it patiently, that that's what God approves of. Patience is only commendable when you've done something good. He's not asking those slaves, those being abused so terribly, to be patient with the hurt. He's not saying that at all. If it's wrong, it's wrong. The only time they need to be patient is when they're being treated for doing good. That's what God approves of. You see, when you come to the scriptures, God would say this to you over and over and over again. It's true with all truth. Christ is your one perfect example of how to respond, how to act, how to think, how to speak. The Lord Jesus is your one perfect example. And so he would say in verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Christ suffered for us. God would take you back to your Savior to help you understand the answer of how to deal with the horrors that are coming upon you. And I have to tell you, you're going to have to put yourself in the place of the slave, the one that's being abused, the one that's being misused, the one that's being destroyed. And he says, okay, now listen, Christ suffered for us. He's your example. What, are you, what am I to see there, Lord? You see, he was submissive to the controlling values of man and to the power of man when they bound him, beat him, spat upon him, nailed him to a cross. In pain, he was submissive to that power, to those who were self-righteous, they were hypocritical. Religious leaders who had twisted the scriptures to save, uh, to, um, to serve, to serve their own loss for uh, power, glory. They wanted to maintain their wealth their lifestyle, and it was all the stuff of man's values. And those so-called righteous, those self-righteous, those so-called religious leaders were behind the endorsement of the world's power to use force even against the Savior. And there were the political leaders, too chiefly Pilate, who guarded their continued power to rule above the truth and above righteousness and above law and above justice. Pilate was more concerned of staying in his position. That's what was coming against the Lord Jesus when he submitted. He suffered for us. How did he do that? He suffered two ways. I know you you know the obvious. Two ways. And for that, I let you have verse 24. 
who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That's certainly one way that he suffered for us. You say, well, that's the, that's the only way. No, it isn't. No, he bore our sins, first of all. But there's another way he suffered for us. And here's the answer. Leaving us an example. He did it to leave us an example. In other words, an example for us to follow. It wasn't simply that we look at him and see him suffering. He's saying, look at me, but understand from this how you should act. An example for us to follow. They reviled him. He didn't revile in return. Did he have grounds to revile them? Oh, my, yes. But that'll come later when the sinners stand before him as their judge. And they're condemned to an eternity of suffering. That'll come later. He suffered, but he didn't threaten. Could he have threatened? Oh, my, yes. Oh, goodness, he could have. For they're going to be held guilty for every sin, every evil, every deed. And they're going to suffer a judgment fitted to every sin. Well, what was the answer to how Christ should respond to such unjust, such godless, such vile, evil, blasphemous, sacrilege? How, how, what's the answer? Well, Verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He committed himself to him who judges righteously. That means this. Our Lord submitted to the pain, to the abuse, and left the dealing with the evildoers to his Father. That's what he did. He submitted to what was going on against him, and he left judgment with the Father. So we see what he did, what he was able to bring to us that we might, what? Verse 24, that we might live. That's what he did it for, that we might live. Now, I think you first of all have to see here that we might live to mean life eternal. Being cleansed from sin, being forgiven. He did it for us to have that. Because here it says, by his stripes, we have been healed. That's the proper interpretation of that verse in Isaiah 53. That our healing was from sin. Our healing was when God gave us his righteousness. Through Jesus, through the shedding of his blood. We've been healed. And, and going back to that phrase, where it's in 24, he didn't threaten, he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Yes, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, should live for righteousness. Not only be saved, but live for righteousness. In other words, to live life in a righteous way, to living out righteousness in our life. He did that as our example to show us that we need to do that. 
are past. Look at 25. For you were like sheep going astray. That's our past. But have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. But because we've cried out to God and he has heard us and answered us and saved us and cleansed us and given us forgiveness and eternal life, that's our present. And that's our eternal future. We've had a past in sin, but now we have a present and an eternal future in righteousness. Chapter 3. At verse 18, the Lord builds on his suffering. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So what he did, he suffered for us to bring us to God. And this talks about being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by the spirit. And it says, look at here, read down with me, by whom also he went and preached to the spirit and spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine suffering, uh, long suffering waited, in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. <clears throat> I read that with you to bring you down to the word water. And you know what happened in a time when the ark was being prepared. God was preparing to do something. He was preparing to destroy the world with water. And so he did. But he brought a few through the water in an ark. And that's why in verse 21, and a lot of people have trouble, trouble, trouble with this verse. I tell you, there are whole denominations that fall off the edge on this verse. There's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. And they read that and they say, oh, that's it. The way that we can see that people get saved is to baptize them. So if we get people baptized, they're going to go to heaven. And so let's just make a rule that uh, we do this, we practice this, we have people bring their loved ones to us or they come. And we baptize them, and that seals the deal. And so baptism is raised up as a way of salvation. But it says, there's an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Well, <laughs> they just slip right past the word antitype. Baptism is not a way of salvation. It's a picture. It's an antitype. It's a, it's a, a shadow. It's a form. It's a it's a it's a a way of giving you an example of the truths of salvation. It's not the way of salvation. It just is a picture. It's an antitype. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh. See, a lot of people think, wow, I go into the waters of baptism and I'm cleansed from all the filth in my life and maybe a little bit of the dirt on my skin. Well, and the filth of the flesh is really not the dirt on your skin. The filth of the flesh is all the sin that you've done and committed in your life of flesh. Baptism is not a way of cleansing you from that. Not from the filth of the flesh, oh no, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, how do you get a good conscience toward God? 
And he says the answer is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He takes you to the subject of the resurrection. Huh. The inward answer. See, a lot of people look at baptism in an outward way, the water, the going down, the coming up, or the sprinkling, or the pouring, or whatever manner they may use. They look at the physical. Well, look, God wants us to look at the inner truth. The inward answer of a good conscience toward God is not that outward stuff, but it's seen in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. How can you have a clear conscience? You know what you've been guilty of. You know what you've done in your past. You know your sins, some of them. You can't remember most of them. But you know so that you're, you're unclean. How can you have a true, clear conscience before God? Well, he says, stop looking at your sin. You're not going to have a clear conscience if you look at your sin. No. Then how can I have a clear conscience? Look at what has been done for you in the removal of your sin. Look at the declaration that God gives you that the work is finished. That he has truly given you new life. Well, what can I look at to see proof for me, and I need proof, that God truly has done something for me that says to me, the work is done. I don't need to rehash the issues of my sin. And he says, what you need to look at is the resurrection. Having the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ applied to us. That's what happens when you receive him as your Savior. That's the act of God when he saves us. He puts to our credit the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You see, this is seen symbolically, symbolically in baptism. Baptism doesn't give this to you. You see, it's just a picture of what? Of the real thing, the real work. The real work is the work of Christ in the death, burial, and resurrection that he gives to us, the effect of that. When Christ came up from the water in his baptism, and when we come up from the water in our baptism, we have a picture of resurrection, a picture of newness of life. You come out of death. When Christ came out of the tomb, he was displaying victory over death, and he was giving that to us. Resurrection is our basis for having a clear conscience before God. Why don't I have to go around thinking of all my past and my sin and my failure, and I still am so prone to sin? When you have received Jesus, the victory of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the finished work of Christ, is put to your account. And the resurrection says to you, it's finished. You have newness of life. The resurrection proves that God doesn't just give you forgiveness of sin. He gives you newness of life. Newness of life that's eternal. And that gift frees you from just looking at your sin, just thinking of how horrible your past is. Baptism doesn't save you. It's only a picture. Christ saves you. His death, his burial, his resurrection have become yours. <coughs> Why? Well, because 
as the scripture says over and over, <clears throat> when God sees us, he sees us in Christ. In Christ is a key phrase in the book of Ephesians, in Christ. So we're seen in Christ, and Christ is resurrected. Christ is victorious over death, over sin. The days of special focus on the cross are coming. Focus on the tomb and on resurrection. They're coming just a few days from now. But we are already resurrected in Christ. We're seated, in fact, it says in the first chapter of Ephesians, we're seated in the heavenlies. Or second chapter, we're, we're seated in the heavenlies. In Christ Jesus. God has, has given it to us. The work is done. And so we're called to live godly in this present world as those that have been raised from the dead, as those that are victorious. We have a clear conscience. <laughs> we have a clear conscience through the work, the finished work of Christ. But we have a responsibility and an obligation to the one that saved us. He is our example. And he would say to us, you're to live godly in this present world. Let the world see my sacrifice, my power to save, my victory in giving eternal life. Let them see it in you. You're resurrected. Father, thank you for the victory of our Savior over sin and death and hell. Thank you for life eternal. We need your help by the Holy Spirit to live out a righteous life and to help us not constantly go back and believe the Satan's lie that he brings at us over and over to focus on our sin. Lord, we put that under the blood. We ask for strength, for counsel, for power to live godly in this present life. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Rains, for that great message and for all the work you do for bringing, uh, bringing those messages and actually recording them. So that's a good thing. I'm glad that they were recorded. That way we can have them today. But I just want to make a few announcements before we end here. Uh, the website. There's been some improvements there. It's always uh, been changing, but you can check there for... Uh, Transcripts, which are, which are available there for download. I have the YouTube channel there. I have the um, links to the various uh, um, podcast apps where you could subscribe if you want to do that. Each of those podcast outlets has a, has a page. You can go there. You can subscribe and listen to it there. Or you can listen to it right on the website. So there's a few things there. Plus, if you want, we still have uh, postcards. If you'd like to get some of those, just send us your address, and we'll be glad to send some of those out to you. That way you can hand them out to your friends, your family, or your people at your church so that they could also listen to the podcast. So you could do that. And that one being said, um, I keep thinking there was something else, but... I can't think of it right now. <laughs> okay, well, so come back next week because we'll have more. We got plenty more to, to bring you. So thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you learned something from it because that's the main uh, purpose of this. So you can learn something from it. 
These are great uh, lessons from the Word of God taught by our pastor. So come back. And until then, have a great week. Have a great day. And I'll see you next time. So long.